Sabres Live is presented by Seneca Resorts and Casinos. Nothing else comes close. We are going to overtime! A third of the season now in the books for the Sabres and coming off a couple of losses to Pitt as they reset for the week ahead. When you're serious about the game, bet on Buffalo at the only sports books in Western New York. Seneca Resorts and Casinos betting counters are open daily and self-service betting kiosks available 24-7 at all three locations. Whether you visit Seneca, Niagara, Allegheny, or Buffalo Creek, Sports Lounge features the latest lines and multiple screens so you never miss a play. The sports book at Seneca Resorts and Casinos, where the love of the game meets the thrill of the win, a thrill that disappeared over the last night. Uh, Marty, they are, these Sabres, winless without Jeff Skinner in the last two because it was his departure that opened the door for the Friday night loss, <laughs> and then he was unavailable on Saturday. How big is his absence right now, knowing that he is gone for the next two as well due to suspension? Well, it's an interesting question because if you ask people, okay, who, who are the – you can't lose guys on the Buffalo Sabres, right? Tage Thompson is one. Dallin is two. Um, I would put Alex Stock three. Now I'd put Dylan Cousins four. I'd put maybe Owen Power five. I think Jeff Skinner comes lower than most of those guys. But from what I was – well, okay, okay. the five-minute major, let's just – yeah, it's kind of funny that he's 0-2 because he was kicked out. But let's look at just the Saturday night game against Pittsburgh. And even though the Sabres had 71 shot attempts, and in the third period, I think it was 35-14, to 14, score effect, but they, they made their push. I feel like, and this is going to be a weird thing to say, like we've talked about Skinner and Thompson as a duo, and the chemistry they have together, I felt like Tage was a little lost. And now the loss of Jeff Skinner kind of make Tage Thompson being a little bit lost. And Alex Duck in return, like, is kind of like, okay, well, where do I fit in here? So, yeah, the absence of Jeff Skinner against Pittsburgh uh, was huge, in my opinion. And it's not that Thompson line was fantastic against Pittsburgh on Friday night. They had their moments, right? When Skinner scored uh, his goal, like it was a big goal. They had their moments. Mm -hmm. but they're not going to have multiple nights in a row where they're not going to be impactful, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Thompson line is going to be impactful regularly. But so Friday night, eh, they had their moments. I did not think they were at their best. And then Saturday, again, I felt like, well, we didn't see Tage the way we normally see him. So the loss of Skinner, in my opinion, now becomes very impactful. And it's impactful moving forward. Cause you got two more games without him. So yeah, it's, I don't know. Duffer, I don't know if you see it the same way. I didn't think it was going to be that much of an issue. And then after watching them against Pittsburgh, I felt it's pretty significant. Well, I think my issue became the way the penguins played Buffalo both nights. And it was interesting to hear Don um, mention how he thought they played the penguins played on Friday, which was they kind of waited them out. So yeah. a lot of people were really excited about how Buffalo was playing and for good reason on Friday. But to me, it was also a style that Pittsburgh was playing. And again, this is the Penguins. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they are still where they want to be. And the Sabres are not. And the reason I'm going down this path is and you're never supposed to critique the wins. So we try not to critique the wins too hard in the moment. But the flip side is when you're constantly losing to the better teams, you have to look at, okay, well, who did they beat? And right now the Sabres have three wins against teams that, you know, when the action ended on Saturday were playoff teams. Yeah. That's not a lot. And so, and I'm not saying it's surprising either. It's just, I think it felt more like the reality of the season because of how the Penguins play the game. And the Penguins can play a lot of ways, but I was more fixated because of the run that Jari's been on, the penalty kill dominance that they've been displaying. They clearly have some significant structure to their overall game. And 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 I think it hurt. I think it was hard for Buffalo to figure out a good team like Pittsburgh. And it's almost like, I mean, we are going to revisit the Friday, Saturday night because in 28 hours, okay, like from 7 on Friday night to 11 on Sunday, uh, on Saturday, 28 hours, right? A lot could have changed. 
you Correct. bank four points and it's like, whoa, like this is going in a different direction now. Mm -hmm. And you get one out of four, right? Even if you got three, it's a, it's a much different thing on Sunday that, you know, people wake up to talking about. Uh, but the way that I look at it is, okay, you, you were in this mini playoff scenario. You have the same team on back to back. You see them on Friday. You prepare, you pre-scout. Pittsburgh basically did Tampa Bay of 2000 and what was it? 11 when they, they refused to fork check the Philadelphia Flyers oh. and the Flyers were like playing back and forth. Like Pittsburgh basically did that. Mm -hmm. He refused to four check. They said, we know Buffalo is going to want to bring it back in their zone and go D to D and wait it out. And they've got really good offensive talent that if you give them chances on the rush, they'll beat you. So let's just put five in the neutral zone. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing. And didn't adjust it well on Saturday because Pittsburgh did the exact same thing. Now, okay, and, well, and established an early lead, which allowed them to do which, it even more significantly, yes. right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was a big key, and and then so you're looking at three things: one, Pittsburgh sitting back five man in the neutral zone; two, the Sabers penalty kill, which has been not performing well. And then you start with two power plays to start the game on Saturday. And everybody, everybody in the locker room, when asked about the game, well, you can't start with taking two penalties, two stick right. penalties, a hooking and a high stick. And three is Pittsburgh penalty kill. They gave you the look on Friday night, what we are going to do. We are going to glue somebody to Tage Thompson. Mm -hmm. And now Tage is looking to move around where usually Tage is on the left flank. It's like, feed me. I'll take the one timer. I'll give it back to Dowling again. Like it's back and forth. And now Tage is like, I can't, I, I have somebody glued to me. I'm going to move around. And they weren't able to adjust. So I remember earlier in the season when they lost to Tampa Bay, Don Granado says, we didn't get beat on skills. We got beat on experience. Well, I'll tell you this, Buffalo had a ton more skills, in my opinion, than Pittsburgh on Friday and Saturday. And they didn't even get beat on experience. They got beat on structure. And that is the first time this year I feel that the Sabres failed to, to break through a structure. Like, mm -hmm. And now teams are going to take notice. And how yeah. do they respond? Like, do you think LA has taken notice? They're like, mm -hmm. well, how can we beat Buffalo and Buffalo Tuesday night? Well, we're going to sit back. And we're going to plug up the neutral zone and see what we can do. Yeah, it's possible for sure. I mean, you think of the good teams that Buffalo has played in their division. I mean, you know, they didn't beat Boston or Toronto or Tampa and, you know, Carolina they lost to Florida. Um, yeah. like these are Florida's not even where they want to be yet, but you know what I mean? But I, I, I do feel like the Pittsburgh one was, was a little bit more pronounced as far as structure now. So the Pittsburgh games happen on the heels of a blowout and the blowouts are fun. And the Sabres have had their share, like uh, a lot of them this year, which is long overdue. And the fan base is giddy on those nights and they should be like Vancouver, Detroit, Montreal, St. Louis, Columbus. Like those have all been really, you know, enjoyable nights. Um, yeah. Most, a lot of them at home, which were good. Um, yeah. Even the New Jersey night at home, losing three, one was, I felt a good night. Like I felt like they, we're able to adjust and break through what New Jersey had done in the first 20 minutes, which New Jersey walked all over them. They adjusted, and I felt like at the end of the night, I'm thinking, oh, they took a step forward. Even in the loss, they took a step forward. Against Pittsburgh, one point out of four, I mm -hmm. didn't feel that step forward was taken. So with the blowouts, they ascended to number one in the league in goals per game. Uh, coming out of Saturday's game, they were sitting number two. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether they finish first, third, sixth, or eighth. If they end anywhere in the top 10 yeah. in goals per game, people are going to look back at this season and go, oh, wow, that was a that was a big leap forward. Uh, the question is now on the heels of scoring four against Pittsburgh over two games, like, and regardless of whether Skinner's there or not, it's more everything you talked about, how other teams are going to defend. How are they going to manage this expectation they have of themselves and quite frankly what they have to do to win games because they they are not seemingly going to be winning many one nothing two one games here anytime soon 
No, because as uh, you pointed out, and as I was tracking earlier in the season, the amount of times that they've given up three plus this year keeps going. Twenty-one even though, of the last twenty-three. Yeah, and even though well, the Crosby three-one goal was late, and you know maybe they were going to pull the goalie, they didn't. They, maybe there was a penalty that should have been called on Latang on Dylan Cousins. It wasn't called. It's still three. When you look at it at the end of the night. You still gave up three. It's hard to win when you give up three, but the Sabres have been able to do it because of their offense. So they do have to be better defensively, but I do feel that it's much more of a penalty kill situation because if they had given up, let's see over the last three weeks, five less goals on the penalty kill, right? Makes a big difference. All of a sudden you maybe collected four points, in the, in the standings because you gave up five less goals on the on a penalty kill. And I'm not asking for 95% success right. rate on the penalty kill. I'm asking for 82%. It, yeah. You know, like high, high seventies would be a big improvement now. Unfortunately. Exactly. Could, yeah. Yeah. I'm not even asking for 85 because 85 mm -hmm. would be like, well, 85 is probably top 12, top 13 in the league. Right. I'm, right. I, I'm yeah. saying like 80 to 82%. Like you give up two goals on 10 chances. Like right now, it's three and 10 chances. And if you take penalties the way that they have, well, it's a goal every other game that you're given too much. And a goal every other game, well, over 10 games, that's five more goals. It mm -hmm. makes a big difference. So that is that, that to me is exactly where I want the change to be made. Yeah, but at the same time, if you could, like, are, are you answering in the affirmative then that the offense is likely to continue to stay up there or do you worry? I mean, it's a third of the year. It's, it's arguably the third of the year where maybe it's easier to get points, right? Because you've lived it like the season becomes a grind and it, it, a lot of things can feel different midway and later in the year than they did when the season is full of optimism at the start. I think that's how I'm yeah. presenting this. So plus, no, and, wait, plus yeah. there's the, the 20, you know, the kid line, if you will, like you have to be realistic about your projection uh, of them here. Right. <laughs> I said that last week, right. I said, look, I don't want to break up that line, but at some point, yeah. like they'll hit road bumps and sure. maybe you're going to have to change pieces around and maybe they come back together later. I'm mm -hmm. not at that point yet oh, to say, Oh my yesterday. God, let's blow it up because I still feel like they generate most of the chances mm -hmm. on Saturday night. Right. So, but it comes down to again, like, okay, Casey Millstadt ends up playing top line with Thompson and talk on the 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 heels of what was probably Joe's Olafson and Middlestad's best game. Mm -hmm. So now you're breaking up that line after what possibly was their best game because you have to fill a need because Skinner is gone. There's the impact of Jeff Skinner's absence, where not only are you affecting the Thompson line, you're affecting the Tyson Joe's line. And then in Saturday against uh Pittsburgh again, well, the Aspen Olafson Joe's line didn't really like look like they had much to give offensively. But I do think the offense is going to stay the same. And let, you're right. It doesn't have to be top two. It doesn't have to be top four, top five, top 10 in the league within a few goals up or back of, of a few spots. Absolutely fantastic to be there. Uh, but you're going to have to really find a way to grinding out, grind it out uh, because teams are going to have a little bit of a better book on what to do against you. And, and it comes back to and I said it a lot, you know, the Sabres like that puck possession game. Mm -hmm. They like to, oh, there's nothing in the neutral zone. Let's scroll back. Let's give it to our D. And then let's bring it back into our zone. Let's go D to D and wait and wait. Now, you can do that at times. But the best chances that the Sabres had over the last two games against Pittsburgh was when they moved the puck quickly. And if you didn't have anything up front, you got it in behind their D. And to a man after the game Saturday, they're like, well, we got to get the puck behind their D. Got to get the puck behind their D. And it's it's easy easier said than done. It becomes almost like a, oh, I don't know that we like playing that way, getting the puck behind their D. We like to skate the puck behind their D, not just chip it behind their D, but... You, you may have to do that more often now, and it may take away a, a goal a game, but you're still going to score. You have fantastic players. Mm -hmm. Who had the more significant week, Peyton Krebs or Casey Middlestat? I will say, uh, I, I'm going to say Peyton Krebs. And I know that Middlestat had the three assists on Friday night, 
And I think that was and uh, top line duty Saturday and top line duty Saturday. So that's significant, but we have a lot of hope and, and looking ahead to what Peyton Krebs could be, especially with the way Paterka and Quinn are playing right now. Mm -hmm. And Don Granados talked about Peyton Krebs, about how hard he's worked and how he put him with Oposo and Gergensen's because, um, it was it was a reward. It was a hey, we're gonna put you with these two because you're playing hard. And then he gets the goal in Columbus. He gets the goal in Pittsburgh Saturday night. I think to me that is a significant step forward. Now, here's the problem with young players in the NHL. It's not just Peyton Krebs. It's it's a white brush painted around the NHL. Is can you keep it going? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the reason why it's the best league in the world and why. 21 year old players usually don't come in and have 70 points in a season because it's a tough league to keep it going. And Krebs has had moments this year, even though he didn't score until Wednesday against Columbus, he had moment this year where you're like, Oh, good game by Krebs. Good game by Krebs. Not a goal, but good game. by. But there was never that next, that next thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I would answer with Peyton Krebs, even though, he had two goals in the three games. Middlestad had the three assists. Um, I, I would say Krebs. Do you, do you agree? Um, I'm not really. I, I don't know. I don't have the resume that you do to answer that question. My 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 training uh, is in asking I would, questions, not answering. So I would say you've seen and have a really no, good understanding I, at everything. I, and maybe I, maybe I'm I blurt out opinions every now and again, much to my own uh, demise. But uh, um. <laughs> No, I honestly, I, I mean, the reason I asked it obviously was because I thought it was a hard one to answer. Like, yeah. I, I, I think, I think personal biases uh, probably come into play from the fan base, and they're more frustrated with Casey because he's been here longer, so they're not likely going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and they would mostly gravitate towards Peyton. Uh, I tend to be a little bit of a. <laughs> Like I'm all inclusive on this. <laughs> I'm I'm quite happy for both <laughs> that they had yeah. you know had their moments. I, um, but I I think we're sitting here in this in this great period at least of the next two games of wondering. Okay, do they keep giving Casey the opportunity, or does Peyton move up, or you know and that so, maybe is the reason why I answered it the way I did, Duffer. It's because yeah. Saturday morning when we're getting ready for the game, and I'm talking mm -hmm. to our producer Jeff, and he's like, "What do you think they're going to do with the lineup?" The first person I thought was going to move up to the left wing spot with Dave Thompson and Alex Tuck was Peyton Krebs, mm -hmm. maybe because I didn't want to break up Middlestat, Jostin, and Olafson because they had played well Friday night. Right. So right. I'm like. So Krebs was the first person that I thought. And maybe in the same way, I'm thinking I saw a significant like step by Krebs, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe the expectation with Krebs are not the same as with Middlestat. Middlestat, the expectations are a little higher. So for him to have a good game Friday night, I'm like, well, he should. It's mm -hmm. Casey Middlestat. He should be. You know, he's been in the league a little longer. He should have those nights. Maybe the expectations for Krebs are not the same that I felt like, wow, he's had a, a, a more significant week in my opinion. So that, that's another way to answer the question. Henry Arkeharyu though is out now uh, week to week, lower body injury. So joins Labushkin on the sidelines and you know, the defense is what it will be here moving forward, but it includes Owen Power who, who is what at this point <laughs> beyond his zero goals in 28 games, which I find, astounding and not in an like I, I'm not blaming Owen in any way I just find it hard to believe that he has zero based on the fact that nobody and it's not even close nobody has been on the ice for more five on five goals this year for Buffalo than Owen Power like he's seven ahead of Rasmus Dahlin like how has he not got one this is this is baffling to me yeah, so early in the season, what we saw out of Owen is, well, he wasn't scoring goals. Uh, he was getting some points. He had 10 assists. He's still sitting now at 10 assists, right? So um, he hasn't had a point in what I'm counting right now, the last six games. we got to go back to the game against Tampa Bay at home that the Sabres lost 6-5 in OT on Stamco's goal. That's the last game that Owen Powers had an assist. Um, I like Owen's game to a certain level. If I hadn't seen Owen Power play the last 
what was it? Uh, eight games last year. Yes. Can, that the last eight games last year and play the way that he did last year and mm. play the way that he did at some point earlier in the season. Now, again, he's elevated that, that level, you know, the expectation. I'm like, well, Owen needs to be here. Mm. Now I feel like he's taken a little bit of a step underneath that level of expectation. The last few games. Um, is it all on him? Absolutely not. And is this lower level better than a lot of other players' best level? Absolutely. But there, he, he's had chances. He's had chances to get the puck to the net. He's had chances to make good plays. And I, I almost want to see a little bit more of that. I'm going to knock you out, right? Like, I'm getting that chance. I'm gonna, Like, Darlene had a couple of really good chances early in the game, Friday night against Pittsburgh. And then he got back to the bench with a stick on his head, like, oh, like that needs to go in. I need to score there. Like there was some fire in him. Mm -hmm. Owen hasn't developed that yet. So he'll miss a chance. And I feel like, okay, like I'm still getting used to it. And look, it took Rasmus Dalian a long time to develop that point too, right? To be elite and want to be the best every night. So Owen's been good, uh, but... uh, Again, if I hadn't seen him play the way that he did in the eight year, games last year, I would say, well, it's just his first year he's going to get there. But yeah. I feel like he came in with such a boom last year that I want him back there. Yeah, but it's totally different. I yes, mean, it is. There's no pressure at that point for him. And he's None. coming off a year where he dominated in college and he's feeling pretty good about himself. It was good, yeah. I mean, but again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the offensive numbers. Like, how realistic is it to continue knowing that like the season changes as it moves forward and it changes for, you know, teams because of where they end up in the standings. And it's totally different for college kids who join at the end of a season yeah. on non-playoff teams, right? Like that's, it's free hockey for them. Yes. I know it's a business, but it's free hockey for them at that point in time. Um, but powers leading all rookies, as we know, you know, basically 24 minutes a night. Um He's also been on for the most goals against at five on five to go with his on the ice for the most goals for, um, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I think this is a really interesting stretch here for him. I, I, I tend to, you know, whether it's cliche or not, I mean, I, I, I do think that once it, once it kind of breaks open for him here, it, it could be a dramatically different offensive Owen power, but I don't know if I'm expecting it here, you know, over the course of the entirety of the first season, but um... no, and, and you're right. And also, how do you? So last game Saturday night, what they did is they did play Bryson with power, right? And they had mm-hmm. Clegg with Fitzgerald. Um, I thought Kel Clegg played pretty well. I thought he had some good moments. I actually thought Casey Fitzgerald played pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't look early in the season when Samuelson and Yokiari were hurt. They ended up playing Darlene and Power a lot, right? And they did play some shifts together as well uh, on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. I would prefer finding, again, a good top four. So you have Darlene and Samuelson and then have Power and then find somebody that you could say, they are going to be good together. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Bryson's the right person for that. And, And not... Nothing against Jacob. He's, he's he's a good defenseman, but I don't know that that's the same game mm-hmm. that you play with, with that Owen will play with Yoki Aryu. And so, do you have that person? Is this where you also miss Lubushkin now? Because maybe Lubushkin would be the guy to say, "Okay, I'll slide in with Bri- with Power, and we'll make mm-hmm. it happen." Or is it Clegg? Or is it Pilot? Or is it trying something else? To say we can try, or maybe it's Samuelson with power, and Darlene ends up playing with with one of the other guys. Like, how can you make that work? There's so many different ways to go about it, and I think this is a time now to explore a little bit because you, unfortunately, you got Henry hurt for week to week. It's not just oh, we got to get through two games. No, you may mm-hmm. have to get through seven games. Like you don't know. Right. Um, last word, unless you have something crazy else to offer. Um, I'm sure many people would love your latest assessment of Lukanen based on the fact he's now he's played 20 games in the NHL. And um, you know where I stand. I, I, I would like the leash to be uh, non-choking at this point. Um, it, but it seems like people are 
well, they're entitled to their prerogative. I just, I, I think it's a little, <laughs> it's a little well, much re- right now. Yes. And the reason why people are where they're at is because this team is second in scoring in the league. Right. So mm. they're looking at it as in, okay, we're not asking shutouts night after night, Dominic Hasek style. Uh, but we're also not asking Marty Biron getting lit up like seven goals a night against the Ottawa senators. Like we're, we're asking somewhere in between. Right. <laughs> and what, what, doesn't give the right impression is the it's not the amount of goals i don't think it's what the problem is here you know the league is trending upwards there's more talents there's more goals being scored but it's the kind of goals and how these goals are happening uh that seems to be catching people's attention it catches my attention i thought upl on saturday night was good Mm -hmm. right at the end of the night you say that was a good game right um did I like the first Crosby goal, the second goal of the game? No, I don't. Everybody gives up goals that, eh, you don't like that goal. But if it's every game that there's that one goal, mm-hmm. then it becomes eh, like, okay, how does that get fixed? How many games into the year or into a career does that get fixed? Um, because I can recall goalies that I played against that were maybe – 20 games, 30 games into their career that they they stayed the same. They stayed that same goalie throughout their career. I see still a goaltender that's searching to see how he's going to play the game. UPL can be very quick with his legs, can be really good long, down low, can have great reaction time, uh, but sometimes overthinks the game, right? Yeah. I have to be here. Where am I? Like, and the well, the goal beat me, but I was in the right position. Like that may work in juniors and that may work in the American league, but in the national hockey league, being in the right position is not good enough. You have to do more. And Craig Anderson's a perfect example of that because Andy's had a good season. In my opinion, his numbers show that, well, he's better than league average and safe percentage and and all of that. Um, Sometimes he's cut out of position and he's like, I got to do everything I can to make that save. That's something that I think UPL has to learn and it takes time. So I'm still willing to give him a lot of time. He's doing exactly what the Sabres wanted to do. He's playing games. The difference is now he's playing them in Buffalo and everybody wants them, wants them to win games. I get it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to like, if I had to give him a grade on, on Saturday night, I would give him a, a B that, that would be a grade like that. I would give him a B is a B getting you a win. Most nights, yeah, it will get you a win, but yeah. it can also get you a loss when your team only scores one goal. Well, we expect to see much more of him in this upcoming stretch. It's Kings at home before road games against Colorado, Arizona, and Vegas. And, of course, we're back on the air in our traditional radio and television format on Tuesday at noon. We'll see you then.